generous introduction, but thanks to Scott and Byron, not just for their leadership of Bay Planning, um, but for being partners to a lot of us in this room, including, I want to note, the Port of Oakland. It's really Environ and their team that worked with the port to lower emissions, uh, diesel emissions from port-related sources by 70% since 2009 from a 2005 base level. Truly amazing accomplishment. And that was done while cargo grew 3% and the port continued to power over 73,000 jobs in the region. So a true accomplishment. I was asked to remind everybody, questions, questions, questions. I was impressed at how many Secretary Ross get, but I wouldn't be surprised if our panel gets even a few more. Okay, so a lot of you guys know me as a port guy or as a lobbyist up in Sacramento, and whether I was uh, working in my professional life or personal life, I've always been drawn to the waterfront, um, probably for a lot of the reasons that we all are drawn to the waterfront. It's beautiful, it, it feels exhilarating, it's healthy to be outdoors. And uh, it's great to be back here wearing a slightly different, uh, different hat, but still very actively involved in the policy and promotion of our waterfront. And all the positions that uh, I've had, we, we, we've been able to advocate for things like classroom-based charter schools on the waterfront, maritime museums on the waterfront, so, uh, solar incubators on the waterfront, and even uh, science research institutions on the waterfront. With some, we've had a lot of success. With others, not so much. And I think that uh, being at the ports in particular is a great lesson in the challenges of waterfront development. And I want to take a slight di slightly different twist on the title of this panel, which says, what does the future hold? Because it suggests a somewhat passive role that we might have toward the future. Whereas the people up here and those of us in this room are not so much waiting to see what the future holds, but really saying, what do we want to see in the future? What should we do with the waterfront? How should we take advantage of these incredible assets we have? Now, like most people in the room, we not only work in ways that are related to the waterfront, we also like to walk along the waterfront with our kids or our dogs, enjoy you know, unadulterated coastal habitat. Uh, we like to surf on, you know, or, or sail on pristine water and breathe clean air. So in short, we kind of want it all. But there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs to different courses of development. And the goal of this panel is to be part of a regional discussion, which usually happens project by project, but really try and start or be part of a regional discussion that's going to address, as a region, what do we want to see out of our waterfront? A few weeks ago, in the wake of the Warriors announcing that they were abandoning the San Francisco site for a Salesforce site in the Mission Bay, the Bay Area News Group, and we're glad to have Angela Woodall here from the Bay Area News Group um, family today, they ran an in-depth story in several of their papers calling the move the latest in a long line of Bay development defeats. Their narrative, briefly, was that from the gold rush to the 1970s, the Bay was getting filled by evil developers in the rapacious maritime industry and is now ruled by crazy environmentalists and suffocating bureaucrats. But as we know from the incredible panelists we have here today, it's much more nuanced than that. Um, and so hopefully we'll have a, an enlightened discussion. And to address the central question, we've assembled some people who are really hands-on over the last decade and certainly for the foreseeable future shaping our waterfront. Each of them is going to give a brief opening introduction, um, you know, their perspective on the timeline we, sh we should be looking at, the criteria we should be looking at as we think about the benefits of our waterfront. I'll then ask them a few questions and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Now one panelist we're not going to be hearing from today, and I, I want to just provide him a, a few words uh, uh, in absentia, is uh, Contra Costa County Supervisor Federal Glover. Unfortunately fell ill, we wish him the best. You know, while many people think somewhat narrowly about the Bay as really being dominated by the, the twin, city of San Francisco, twin cities of San Francisco and Oakland and all the high-profile waterfront developments they have, the Bay is obviously much broader than that. And uh, credit to Supervisor Glover and the stakeholders involved in the Northern Waterfront Economic Development Initiative for reminding us that the Bay is much broader. The Waterfront Initiative um, that they're leading is about stewarding and developing approximately 50 miles of Contra Costa's northern waterfront. To quote the supervisor in his absence, I want to bring together all the stakeholders on the county's northern waterfront, from Hercules to Oakley, to find out if there are any common projects we can work on together. That includes private industry ports and the waterfront cities. I believe that if we act as a regional group, we can wield more influence than each of us tried to act alone. The North Shore is one of the county's greatest resources, and it is underutilized. I want to change that. Well said, Supervisor. If any of the panelists have any thoughts on the initiative, I'm sure they'll share. We're going to start with a statewide perspective, sort of an overview slash refresher of the laws that govern our waterfront. Um, then we're going to uh, take a look at the international maritime perspective, sort of step back and also look at how the international dynamics of maritime trade can affect us here locally. Then we're going to get into the local government perspective and finally 
um, some really rich uh, perspectives from some developers who've uh, been both successful and unsuccessful in moving things forward on the waterfront. So I'd like to start by introducing the Executive Officer of the State Lands Commission, which, as most of you know, consists of our State Controller, Lieutenant Governor, and the Department of Finance. This three-member entity really governs the use of state lands, which most of our waterfront lands here are in the Bay Area. Uh, Jennifer began with, Jennifer Lucchesi ba began with the State Lands Commission back in 1999. And I know you, a lot of you can read her bio, so I'm going to try to give a little bit of a personal twist and perspective on it. In the last 15 years then, she's overseen, sure, she's been involved in the commission with the rise and ultimate ebb to, to some extent of the Trans-Pacific trade. She's been there with the fluorescence of the environmental laws that no other state in the country has around um, the maritime industry. Um, she's also been there in the, with the rise of the waterfront stadium craze. Um, like most of us, she has both personal roots as well as professional roots tied to the waterfront. She's from another great waterfront city, Seattle. And before she began with the commission, she was a lifeguard uh, in the Port San Luis Harbor District. Let's welcome Jennifer Lucchesi. Good morning. It's um, a pleasure to be here in front of you today and also be a part of this panel. Um, I've worked with many people on this panel um, on, on very interesting, complex, and, um, and wonderful projects. So it's, it's um, an honor to be here with them. Um, my, my goal here is to give a statewide perspective, um, but I'm also here to give a bit of a history lesson. I'm going to focus on the public trust doctrine because the um, future uh, um, of our waterfronts, of our tide and submerged lands, of our coast, really began with the public trust doctrine, and it will continue to guide and help us plan for our future along the waterfront. Um, I was actually reading an article the other day um, about public access issues involving um, Martins Beach and, and Half Moon Bay. And the article made a statement that the 1976 Coastal Act all tidelands and submerged lands lying waterward of the mean high tide line to be public lands. And while, the, and that really struck me because um, the ownership of the state's uh, tidelands and submerged lands, that's what the State Lands Commission manages, that's what we do on a daily basis. And while the Coastal Act and other coastal regulatory laws, um, including the McAteer Petrus Act, are incredibly important and have greatly influenced how the state's waterfronts are developed and protected. The people's ownership, the state's ownership of its tide and submerged lands and its navigable waterways actually date back to statehood and even before that. Um, it's interesting because um, not a day goes by in our office, in our internal meetings, talking about proposed projects or uses or developments that we don't begin our meetings in 1850. <laughs> the origins of the public trust doctrine are to Roman law concepts of common property where the airs, the rivers, the sea, and the seashore were incapable of private ownership. This concept that the waterways are unique and that the government holds them in trust for the people have endured through the ages. Under common law, English common law, this principle evolved into the public trust doctrine. Oh, there, that's probably louder. <laughs> Pursuant to which the sovereign holds navigable waterways as a trustee of a public trust for the benefit of all people for various water-related uses. After the American Revolution, each of the original states succeeded to this sovereign right and duty. Each state became a trustee of its navigable waterways within its boundaries for the common use by the people. When California was admitted into the Union in 1850, it too succeeded to the same right and duty um, under the Equal Footing Doctrine. There, um, these lands, which include filled and unfilled tidelands underlying San Francisco Bay, the Delta, and the tide and submerged lands out three miles, are generally referred to public trust lands. As background, the State Lands Commission was created in 1938 following um, a scandal regarding the malfeasance of, um, of the management of these public trust lands and resources. So the legislature in 1938 um, created the State Lands Commission, an independent body, um, uh, um, which membership has previously been mentioned, the lieutenant governor, the state controller, and the director of finance, um, to administer the state's property interests in these trust lands, in these resources. These resources also include all of the state's oil and gas leases um, and minerals off offshore. The commission is a land and resource manager. 
It's not a regulatory agency, um, both in terms of the lands and resources it directly manages and those lands that have been legislatively granted in trust to local jurisdictions for management. In the Bay Area here, those are, include the Port of San Francisco, the City of Redwood City, the Port of Oakland. Similarly, those local jurisdictions where, tied, where the legislature has transferred the daily control and management of these lands also have those same duties to manage, to protect, um, to um, preserve those trust assets as a trust manager. Actually, most of, the, um, most of the major commercial ports in California all trace their development to legislative trust grants of the state's tied and submerged lands. Each of the ports from Oakland to San Francisco, Redwood City in the Bay Area to um, the Port of Long Beach, Los Angeles, and San Diego all began with a statutory trust grant. Um, excuse me one second. These, um, these granted lands, these local jurisdictions are charged with managing these lands and their assets on behalf of the estate, on behalf of the people of the state for a statewide benefit. So which these, with all this rich history, um, which, with, what does the public trust doctrine um, guide, the, um, guide our waterfront and guide the development of our waterfront, the protection of our waterfront for the, for the um, future? Um, there's a balancing act that has to occur. Um, as time has gone on, California ports and waterfront communities are faced with a balancing of, of an ongoing need to accommodate growth in their maritime dependent activities with enhancing public access to the waterfront and also developing visitor serving amenities that bring people to the waterfront. So how does this public trust doctrine balance, um, guide this balancing act? for the development and protection of our waterfronts. This important doctrine forms the historical basis of California's maritime history. It also forms a historical and legal basis for the state's constitutional provisions, policies, and laws ensuring public access to the state's waterways. As a common law doctrine, there are a myriad of statutes, cases, and actions that have been a part of the evolution of this rather unique area of the law, and we expect more legislation, more cases, and events to leave their mark in the future. But with that said, the fundamental principle remains the same. Public trust lands are publicly owned lands held in trust for water-related, water-oriented public needs. So with all this rich history, what does this mean in today's world? I'm constantly being asked, where is that list that shows what's a trust consistent use and what's not a trust consistent use? There is no black and white list. Um, traditional public trust uses, as well as the expanded uses recognized by the courts, um, include navigation by fishing, but excuse me, commerce by navigation and fisheries. They include um, facilities for the promotion and accommodation of ports, um, such as warehouses, container car cargo storage, and convention and trade facilities. They also include visitor serving amenities like hotels and restaurants um, and water related recreational facilities. Most recently, the courts have said that, that public trust lands may be preserved um, in their, natural, um, in, in their, um, in their uh, natural way for um, preservation, for open space, and for habitat values. That same court in 1971 basically said that um, that the public tr trust doctrine evolves as the public's needs evolve. Um, these lands are unique lands and they should be um, used as the public's changing needs use. As their needs change, uh, um, the waterfront and the use of these lands should, ch land should change with it. Determination of trust consistency of a particular use or project that does not fall within the traditional triad of public trust uses involves a complex weighing of multiple factors including the location to where these lands are to be occupied by the proposed use. The history of those lands, were they historically maritime use, but that maritime use has ceased to exist for um, a, a decade or more? Um, what are the current public trust needs of that property in the surrounding environment? What are the public's trust needs in the foreseeable future? This is obviously a contextual approach. There are no bright line rules in this analysis, um, and each project must be evalu evaluated individually without the comfort of answers provided by abstract prescriptive rules. 
This fact-specific common law approach is obviously hard to apply and admittedly is not uh, necessarily welcomed by those who are, are in the middle of this and trying to assign specific rules to a proposed development. But it has a potential, and it, we have seen this in the past with various uses, such as the AT&T Giants Ballpark, um, the, the maritime industry in San Diego and the Port of LA. This, this, um, this type of a factual, case-by-case, -case, um, contextual approach yields better results um, that is not a one-size-fits-all approach. And so I'll just end, knowing my time is up, that the State Lands Commission, a little plug for the State Lands Commission, this is what we do on a daily basis with the lands we directly manage and with our partnerships with the ports and the waterfront communities. Um, we analyze the history, we work with our partners um, in the grantees um, to develop waterfronts, protect our waterfronts for future generations um, to adapt to changing public trust needs. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you for your role in helping give us some of our great waterfront developments over the years. Okay, our next speaker is going to take us out to the international level, give us a perspective on maritime trade and what are the implications in that industry for uh, developments along the waterfront here in the Bay Area. As promised, I'm not going to read anything that you can read about them in the, in the program. I will say that Mike Jacob has probably done more to help address the competitiveness of California ports than just about any other, anybody else in the room. Um, he and his organization, the Pacific Merchant Shipping Association, as most of, we, most of us know it by PMSA, it's a famous acronym, we're in a very acronym-heavy industry, I think. Um, PMSA it represents the carriers, the folks that, like, everything that's on our table, that we're wearing, that we drove here in, those are the folks that carry it back and forth across the ocean. And so he's really been at the, um, the pulse of what's going on in the maritime industry for uh, more than most of the last decade, if not more. And uh, I won't hold against him that he has an economics degree from Ber UC Berkeley, nor it, I, will I hold against him the fact that he's our only speaker who did PowerPoint slides. So let's welcome Mike Jacob. Thanks, Isaac. Um, I'm here today to represent the rapacious maritime industry, and I'll try to be nuanced in my rapaciousness. Um, the, uh, uh, the idea that we can talk about land use and the future of what's happening in the port without addressing the economic context of how our ports actually operate in California um, is not a realistic one. So I'm glad to be invited by BPC today to talk about a little bit about our competitiveness and the economic context for our land use decision making. Um, if we could go ahead to the next uh, slide, talk a little bit about the, uh, the context we're looking at here. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So the, the idea, um, I think that everyone in the uh, room is familiar with, and ever, certainly everyone on the panel, is that we want to build a virtuous cycle for our investment in infrastructure, where we're actually providing the financing necessary for environmental programs, regulatory costs, and offsetting higher costs as they develop over time. And the way in the maritime industry we do this is through volume. Uh, next slide, please. Um, when we're looking at the context of how many more environmental and regulatory costs we layer onto the system in California, the total just on the air quality side is $5 billion over the last eight years. Um, and it spurs a level of higher costs in addition to all the other higher costs in supply chain that we already inherit just from the fact that we're in California. You see them up there. Uh, next, next slide, please. Um, so we've got bad math going on. Um, we have the opposite of a virtuous cycle, which is to say, when we pile on costs and we don't grow volume, um, our supply chain costs per box in California goes up relative to the rest of the country and to all of our other competitor ports. Uh, next slide, please. So since 2006, um, go ahead to the next one. Um, we've been doing bad math. Here is our um, annual TEU volume. So TEU is the way we measure a container. Um, equivalency in our business. Here we are from 1990 to 2006. Uh, next slide, please. Go ahead and hit it twice. Um, and in 2007, out of the world's 50 largest container ports, there were only two in the world that weren't growing, Los Angeles and Oakland. Um, if you looked at this today, 
Oakland wouldn't even be on the top 50 list. Um, and you'd have Long Beach joining LA. But in 2007, um, this is where we were at, and this was pre-recession, um, and you can see obviously where all of our trading partners are. Um, uh, next slide, please. And in the uh, container business, you know, you always have an axiomatic. If you put something on a ship somewhere, it's gotta get off somewhere. Uh, so you know when you're losing market share. Here's what we've done since 2006. Um, we are not keeping pace with our regular rate of growth on volume. Next slide, please. This is for California, uh, top line um, is LA, next one is Long Beach, and the bottom one is Oakland. Uh, next slide, please. So since 2006 to today, here's uh, where we're at with respect to the largest ports in North America, anything over one and a half million TEUs. Um, you can see that all of our other competitors have been growing volumes. We've been losing them. This includes the recession um, and the time after the recession. Uh, next slide, please. And so here is our market share, uh, 2006. Um, you can see we peaked out. Uh, next slide, please. And as you can imagine, seeing that other slide, um, given our growth rates relative to our competitors, here's where we've been at for the last uh, seven years. This is through. Uh, 2012. The uh, issue for us, uh, next slide please, is that as we as we keep growing, look at this um, slide, we've been predicating our investment both in infrastructure and in environmental regulations. Isaac pointed out in, in uh, Oakland we've reduced emissions by over 70 percent since 2009. In Southern California it's even greater. Um, we're proud of those investments but they you know, just the regulatory side costs $5 billion, and we've been doing stuff way beyond that. It all needs to be financed. And we were making those rules and commitments and regulations and investments based on a chart that looked like this. Uh, if you could take a, a, the next slide, please. And what the state did when they were doing their rulemaking and our cost-benefit analysis and what we've done with respect to our infrastructure uh, is we looked at chart projections that looked like the dotted lines. Again, uh, LA, Long Beach on top, and then Oakland at the bottom. Uh, next slide, please. What we, what we actually ended up doing since 2006 are the solid lines. Um, we're pretty dramatically behind where we anticipated to be in terms of our volume. Again, in terms of financing the infrastructure we want to have on the waterfront to facilitate trade. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and why don't you go ahead and, and go to the next one. Where you can see that the the downturns are pretty dramatic. Um, and we'll get to some of the more specific impacts of that right now. What happened to our direct payroll? Uh, what are the direct economic uh, impacts of having lower volume? Well, in California in 2006, our longshore payroll uh, was just over 1.2 billion, uh, just about $1.2 billion. Um, you can see what the recession did to that. That's 2009, um, right down there in that trough. But we haven't come anywhere close to our old longshore payroll, and I can assure you that our rates haven't gone down since 2006, um, but our volumes have. And when we move fewer boxes, we have fewer longshore gangs on the waterfront. It's just that simple. It's a direct corollary. You can go to the next uh, slide, please. But the, the direct impacts of employment on the longshore labor and, and things like that are part of our economic story, and those are the ones that we care the most about directly on the waterfront, but from a statewide perspective and from a regional perspective, you care about overall economic impact. And you can see that um, Oakland did a study, well, it has a similar one, but we'll focus on Oakland's, uh, that container activities yield tremendous state and local tax revenue, tremendous income uh, per container and jobs per container. Um, and if we go to the next slide, uh, we can talk about what are we missing. We're, we're missing a lot of additional economic activity as a result of missing our mark. But in terms of the, the, the context of the discussion today, that also means that we need to do everything we can to facilitate growth and volumes to pay for the infrastructure and the environmental commitments that we've already made. Um, and we have a tremendous opportunity to reinvest in a way that's clean and green and leads the country 
in partnership with the state. We're working with uh, Caltrans and Transportation Agency right now to grow a, a sustainable freight system um, and to get investment out of the, the next round of federal uh, T and MAP21 uh, uh, authorizations. But in the meantime, it's imperative that as we go through the discussion today about how do we grow the waterfront and maintain the relationships that we have with respect to my membership with the port. In other words, the folks who are actually paying the freight um, and making the investments. How do we make sure that we're protecting those infrastructure investments and the job and economic impact that comes with it? Thank you. Okay, so we have the state perspective, the historical sp perspective of state law. We've got the international maritime perspective. Now, I think the stage is set to delve into what's going on locally. Um, and we have a great speaker to help us get that started. Fred Blackwell has been near or at the top position of the city of Oakland um, on the administrative side for the last four years doing, during probably what's one of the most intense periods of waterfront development. Um, in recent history. And I think it's fair to say that from the public sector side, there's no single person who's been more instrumental in making sure that the Oakland Army Base project, the redevelopment of the Oakland Army Base, what we now call Oakland Global, actually comes to fruition. Um, you know, he's, he has experience on both sides, both in San Francisco and in Oakland, which is invaluable to bring to the mix. And even after his last day with the city of Oakland, which uh, sadly for us is June 16th, um, coming up soon, we're hoping that as he takes over the reins as the executive director of the San Francisco Foundation, which has more than a billion dollars in assets, that he's going to remain involved in waterfront development somehow, some way. No pressure. Please welcome Fred Blackwell. Thank you, uh, Isaac. Uh, I have two warnings before I get started here. The first is that I've been carrying a cold around with me, and I made the mistake of getting on the plane with that cold. So all of you know that what the pressure does and what that does for your hearing. And so if you hear me screaming or yelling, it's not because I'm trying to make a point. It's because it sound, feels like I'm uh, at the bottom of a swimming pool right now. Um, the other uh, warning that I have to give you is sitting back here, all the speakers are kind of front facing so you guys can hear well, but we can't hear well back here. So I don't know what the people before me said. Uh, so. Not only will I be screaming, but I'm going to be off topic. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to start this by saying that when people think about the city of Oakland and where the city of Oakland is mentioned, people think about the diversity of the city. Uh, people think about its uh, industrial roots, uh, its progressive roots, the protest, and all those kinds of things. But what people seldom think about, except for some of the folks who are over here at the Port of Oakland, is that we have 19, almost 20 miles of waterfront in the city of Oakland. Uh, and not a whole lot of people think of us as a city with that kind of asset uh, associated with it. And as Isaac said, um, where we are right now, and I, you know, I work in the city of Oakland, but I grew up here, I can't think of a more exciting, dynamic time uh, for waterfront development, uh, either kind of for stuff that's either in the pipeline or in planning or underway than the moment that we're in right now. Um, and what's happening is that there are uh, both a combination of constraints and opportunities uh, and once in a lifetime kind of transformational uh, opportunities that are creating what are very different um, nuanced but dynamic waterfront development uh, situations in the city of Oakland. I want to just highlight a couple of them and talk about how they're different, but I also want to close with talking about one of the things that they have in common. Um, the first, and Isaac mentioned this, is uh, Oakland Global uh, and the development of the, the Army base. Uh, the opportunity that's being responded to there is the, the decommissioning of the Army base, which happened in the uh, late 90s. Uh, and the Army base was once uh, a pretty important economic engine, not only for uh, the region uh, and for the nation, but for uh, the neighborhood of West Oakland. And so there's been in the closing down of the uh, Army base and the uh, conveyance to the city of Oakland and the Port of Oakland, a tremendous waterfront development opportunity there. 
and really the theme that uh, has been taken on after folks talked about Ferris wheels and casinos and uh, auto dealerships and I think even at one time a uh, movie studio, uh, we've landed on a working waterfront uh, development program there. Uh, and the idea is that uh, we're going to do a combination of uh, bulk uh, marine terminal operations, but also trade and logistics oriented activities that are very supportive of and complementary to the activities that are already going on at the Port of Oakland, which is right adjacent to the Oakland Army Base. And so um, that's one, uh, what we think is a very dynamic opportunity that's very uh, trade, logistics, jobs oriented in terms of how it's responding to the waterfront development opportunity there. The second, and I'm not going to talk a whole uh, lot about it because uh, uh, Mike Gilmetti will talk, uh, I'm sure, uh, in a little bit more detail about Brooklyn Basin, but Brooklyn Basin is a very different waterfront development activity that's going on in the city of Oakland. It's not necessarily jobs oriented or trade oriented or import or export, but it's much more focused in on trying to figure out how to take what was a dilapidated industrial use uh, land use pattern that was going on in that part uh, of the city from Oak to Ninth uh, Avenue um, and really trying to think about how we can enhance the open space, uh, create residential opportunities and create access through those kinds of uses to the waterfront and take advantage of the opportunity that's been associated with kind of repositioning what was a dilapidated industrial area to a much more dynamic, community-oriented, uh, access-oriented use for that site. And that's something that is also underway. By the way, both of those have broken ground and we're uh, underway with both of those projects. Something that is now kind of in the pipeline, more kind of a sparkle in, uh, in the eye of folks right now, uh, and that has not received a lot of attention for its waterfront opportunity, is the planning and, and work that we've been doing around Coliseum City. Uh, what's gotten the most attention is the relationship between that planning work uh, and trying to retain uh, some of the teams that are currently playing uh, in Oakland. Uh, but the, the actual plan area includes the area west of 880 and the waterfront that, it, it, that exists right there uh, and trying to figure out how to really open that up uh, and, and, has it and make it more accessible for waterfront uh, activity as well. And the real idea here is that folks really, um, very few people really get the relationship between the Coliseum BART station and how close that is from a transit perspective to the waterfront in East Oakland. And so we're really trying to figure out ways to make that tie, open up uh, the Coliseum area and more closely align that with, with is really kind of uh, a beautiful waterfront opportunity there as well. The last thing that we're working on right now, uh, which is also very different from uh, the other three that I've talked about in terms of open space, uh, uh, residential and industrial use, uh, is Howard Terminal. Um, and uh, the notion there is really, I think, a response to, uh, to it's a part of the, the port's property that really uh, for the, the longest time has been associated with maritime use, uh, containerized shipment. Um, but the evolution of the, the industry and the evolution of the business approach at the port uh, has created a development opportunity at Howard Terminal. Uh, and uh, the idea there is that there may be the opportunity to site a ballpark or a third phase of Jack London Square or something like that uh, at the Howard Terminal uh, site. And there's another, uh, and so what I would add to that is just it's a, it's a commercial, uh, retail, uh, also waterfront oriented development opportunity there. So I think as, as you hear me talk about this, these are all dynamic, these are all very exciting and all very different uh, in terms of the opportunity that's been created and the approach and response to those opportunities for waterfront development. But while they are all different, they have one thing in common, and that is the need for substantial investments in infrastructure uh, to unlock uh, the potential for development on the waterfront. Uh, some of that uh, uh, infrastructure investment is in the form of transportation and transit investments. Some of it is in the form of creating the access that I mentioned uh, earlier. Some of it is about responding to sea level rise, responding to the fact that some of these areas are fill and have been dropping over time and will require a tremendous amount of surcharging and, and wicking to bring these uh, uh, sites up to the point where they're developable. 
but they all have this in common, that they require substantial infrastructure investment to unlock the opportunity. So I'll stop there, but I just wanted to kind of talk about and give you a sense of kind of where we are, because I think it's a uh, kind of the canary in the coal mine in terms of how local jurisdictions are going to be approaching waterfront development, and it's really about the context and the nature of the opportunity. So I'll stop there and we can talk more later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Fred. Um, you, you, you speak so inspiringly about the waterfront, it makes me think we actually might be able to have it all. Um, our next speaker has uh, probably the, the most successful track record of developing on the waterfront, or at least he's managed to convince everybody out there that indeed that's true. Um, Michael Gometti is the president of Signature Development Group, and he's managed to have this successful track record amazingly without losing a single hair on his head. So credit to that, maybe he'll give us a clue on, on how he pulled that all off. Not only is he developing successfully on the waterfront in, and in Oakland, he's really uh, an enlightened developer who's tapped into the zeitgeist of Oakland uh, with developments, for example, like one that just had a ribbon cutting yesterday called The Hive, which is just blocks away from here in uh, the uptown area of Oakland. So let's welcome to the podium Mike Gilmetti. Thanks. Uh Typical Fred, the last thing he leaves us with before he goes is a, is a cold or something from speaking into his microphone. <laughs> Thanks, Fred. Um, thank you very much uh, to Bay Planning for hosting this and for inviting me to be here, and, and thanks to uh, Isaac as well. Um, I, I, I kind of want to talk about our project a little bit. Um, you know, we've built waterfront projects in Richmond, San Francisco, and Oakland. I think we've done six now uh, in the last 10 years, and they are different. Um, our governor once told me when he was the uh, mayor of Oakland that it's easier to build next to dumb cows than smart people. Uh, and what he was talking about basically is greenfield development versus infill. And there's no place where that's more relevant than uh, building on the waterfront or, or entitling on the waterfront is actually the better term. Um, our project, Brooklyn Basin, uh, we, we were initially chosen by the port of Oakland in, in a um, uh, uh, RFQ process in 2001. We received, uh, we, we got into contract with the port in 2003. We received our initial CEQA approvals in, from the city of Oakland in 2006. We were sued, we were referended, we were sued again. We went back and got new approvals in 2009. We were sued, we won, we, it was appealed, we won again. So 2011, uh, 10 years later, we, um, it's almost like, a, you know, the Gettysburg Address, you know, four score and seven years ago. Um, we, we, got, we were approved 10 years later in the middle of the recession. Um, we were fortunate, yeah, it was great. Um, we, uh, we were fortunate enough um, to find financing, actually, of all places in Beijing, China. Uh, we went with the governor last year to uh, uh, sign that deal in the U.S. Embassy, which was kind of surreal. But um, the, the point here is that it takes a long time. It takes a lot of resources, uh, and, and it shouldn't. Um, we had uh, nine different uh, boards or agencies to get approval from, oftentimes with conflicting uh, goals and agendas. Um, all of them were great to work with. I don't want to disparage anyone, mainly because they're all here. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, they're all, they all are bound by their own either uh, constitutional doctrine or rules and regs, uh, state, federal, uh, uh, and, and uh, regional agencies, and, and local agencies. And they all have their goals, from general plans to, to the state constitution. Um, I think our, our project is about three and a half million square feet, 50% of it is open space, um, 32 acres of, of new parks on the water about the size, say, of, you know, marina green type spaces. Um, we're very excited about it. We just broke ground. Um, but, you know, let's talk about Oakland for a second as a microcosm. We'll kind of drift back between the project and Oakland. Oakland um, sometimes gets a bad rap, but actually has approved, I'm going to say four of the, uh, the more significant waterfront projects. Uh, very quietly in the last 10 years. Uh, Jack London Square, which I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Oakland Bowl, which is the Army Base project, Brooklyn Basin, and one that doesn't get a lot of uh, note is the Martin Luther King Shoreline. And I think those four projects actually, you know, the, the question was put to us is, you know, what's the vision for the, for the waterfront and the bay uh, going forward? And I think those four are uh, uh, examples. Uh, the, the shoreline is either habitat or, or, or you know, trails and, and, and passive and pensive areas. Uh, Brooklyn Basin will be somewhat active. Um, 
we'd like it to be active at least. Uh, we'll have housing, we'll have uh, parks, we'd like it to become a transit hub. Uh, we've got Alameda doing a lot of nice development across the way and a lot of stuff going on Jack London Square and we've got a, a robust transportation plan. Um, and then we have Jack London Square, which should be, I think, probably more of the regional destination retail, offices. Uh, and then we've got uh, Oakland Global, or the Army Base, which is more, um, as, as Fred put it, the working waterfront. And I think if the Bay can develop those four um, types of projects around its, its uh, uh, perimeter, um, I think we're going to be, uh, we're going to do well by our citizens for the environment, for social equity, and for, um, for the economy. Um, I think there's a lot of new ways we should consider uh, entertaining those notions. Um, you know, when uh, we talked about Roman law, since the Emperor Justinian started this uh, kind of doctrine, you know, however many, 1,500 years ago, um, a lot's changed. And this notion of uh, segregated zoning, I think, is somewhat outdated. And I'd really like to see uh, us as a people through our uh, legislature and laws uh, talk about three-dimensional uh, zoning. Um, you know, we've seen great examples around the world of other waterfront cities that have preserved the public feel, but being able to think about things in 3D. Why not have residential on the 20th floor of some building uh, while still having visitors serving retail on the ground floor? Why not integrate parks better into the fabric of uh, projects such that they are lively and active parks. In Oakland, uh, in a lot of urban areas, it's not a great thing to have a park all by itself, okay? Because um, you want the people to be able to inhabit it, uh, to be able to, to you know, have families out there, to pick up games of, uh, you know, catch or walking the dog or, or all that type of stuff. And um, we need to make sure that happens um, in a more expeditious manner. It shouldn't take 10 years to get a project approved. Um, you know, Mission Bay took 25 years, and again, that's not state land's fault or BCD's fault or the city, San Fran city, county, of San Francisco, the port of San Francisco, the port of Oakland, port of uh, city of Oakland, etc. Redwood City, Redwood Shores. This is because you've got all of these agencies in here, and somehow, in my perfect world, uh, there would be a better coordination. Um, the other thing that Fred pointed out was infrastructure. We have a very aging in infrastructure in the uh, inner core of the Bay Area. A lot of it was built. 80 to 120 years ago, and uh, we need to come up with financing mechanisms to deal with it. We also need to come up with financing mechanisms to deal with global um, climate change. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's one thing to say to new projects like Brooklyn Basin, which is one of the first, if not the first, to meet new uh, standards, at least for major projects, for, for climate change. But this is great. So if things happen as bad or worse than people think, we'll be the only project there and you can come visit our island. Um, it, it doesn't do a lot of good. Um, so we, we need to worry about the upland areas and the surrounding areas, even though the new projects uh, meet standards. We have a lot of work in, in, in old-fashioned financing and, and boring infrastructure. I think we have a lot of work to do with regard to, uh, I will call it modern day um, zoning uh, and coordination between agencies. And then hopefully we can get this waterfront that has the things uh, out there, the open space, the industry and business and office, residential. We want to reunite ourselves to this waterfront and not have these notions where we have to have vast swaths of, of waterfront uh, removed from the public eye for generations. Um, and that's what I, hopefully our project is a, is a symbol of. Uh, and hopefully these, these projects in Oakland, since we're in Oakland, become symbols of. So thank you very much for having me today. That was fantastic. And to close out our panel, um, we're going to go to the one panelist who I actually haven't met before today. Um, and I think we'll probably all forgive him if all he does is want to brag about their new head coach. Um, and this is uh, Rick Welts, the president and CEO of the Golden State Warriors. Um, we're, we're certainly excited to hear firsthand, although a lot has been written about what happened with the waterfront development, I think it'll be exciting to hear firsthand um, the experience that they had in trying to develop on the waterfront um, and also get a, the perspective of someone who rose to fame really within the NBA during the golden years with the, the Magic Bird and Jordan years. And so I have one, one thing to offer, which is that if you ever think about going back on the waterfront and need a water-related nexus, just leverage the Splash Brothers brand a little bit more. 
Okay, and grab your questions. Uh, it's time to start submitting questions, so please uh, make sure to fill out one of the cards and pass them up. Let's rec rec uh, welcome Rick Welts. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, so, like, what's a guy who runs a basketball team doing here, right? Uh, you know, I'm listening to Mike talk, and he has more experience in his little finger doing waterfront development than... Uh, than uh, we accomplished over the last two years. And in fact, he has some wins. We're 0 for 1, in case you haven't been uh, keeping score. Uh, actually, uh, starting with the end of the story, I think you're, those of you in the room are probably familiar with it, but uh, we couldn't be more thrilled with kind of where we are today. Uh, the process, maybe a little less thrilled, uh, but where we have ended up purchasing a 12-acre parcel in Mission Bay, uh, which is on the ground. I would say it's waterfront adjacent, but not on the waterfront. Uh, really, we think gives us the opportunity to create something incredibly special for the entire Bay Area that, uh, that we couldn't be more excited about. But actually, it was exactly two years ago, uh, almost to the day, uh, that uh, San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee invited the Warriors uh, to come back to where they started in San Francisco and to build uh, something that the city of San Francisco has never had, a world-class sports and entertainment uh, facility at Piers 3032. And we had a beautiful press conference, and we were off and running. Uh, we didn't do it with our eyes closed. We certainly had a lot of smart people around us telling us uh, uh, exactly what we were getting ourselves into, and nobody underestimated uh, the size of the task at hand. Uh, and I, you know, I will say, make a few comments about that process. I think, uh, you know, I'm proud of the way we engaged in it, number one. I think we uh, had literally hundreds of community meetings. We, uh, uh, as was explained to you by Jennifer, we, I spent most of last summer in uh, Sacramento talking to members of the Assembly and the Senate because ultimately the uh, uh, a piece of legislation did come out of Sacramento that did find that the project that we were talking about uh, had the potential to be a trust consistent use uh, on behalf of all the citizens. Uh, and that was that was heavy lifting. Uh, you know, I, I Larry Goldspan is sitting right down here to my right to keep an eye on me to make sure that uh, I only say great things about BCDC. And I will only say great things about BCDC staff, I promise, Larry. Uh, because the process, you know, that we had to go through reached every level. We started with dozens of uh, citizens advisory committee meetings at the super local level, uh, regional jurisdiction with, with BCDC, uh, state jurisdiction by, by having to get federal legislation for our, pro or excuse me, state legislation for our project, and, and really at the federal level as well with the Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, we spent the better part of two years uh, and over $20 million of our money uh, to try to build uh, a privately financed uh, project at Piers 3032, these 12 amazing acres uh, almost under the Bay Bridge on the San Francisco waterfront. And I will say I think the process, especially with BCDC did, and the CACs, did, did create a better project than the one we had originally envisioned. Uh, I think we went through three complete project redesigns, much of that in direct response to the CAC and to BCDC. Uh, what we ended up with was uh, an arena smaller than the one where we play. My landlord's over here, too. Uh, you know, Fred's my landlord here at Oracle, so I have to be really nice to Fred. He's a good guy. Uh, <clears throat> but we're going to build an 18,000-seat sports and entertainment complex. Over half that 12-acre site was going to be devoted to public space, uh, really to reclaim th those piers for people to enter to enjoy on a daily basis, 365 days a year. We were able to find a new home for the San Francisco Fireboat Fleet and a new fire station at the site. We were able to accommodate an overflow cruise ship berth when uh, the new cruise ship terminal uh, is at capacity, a place for an additional cruise ship uh, to birth, and the list really went on and on. Nine, nine, almost 90,000 square feet of retail and restaurants that would have added to the experience of attending events there. Uh, so why not keep going? Uh, we had a lot of unanswered questions. The process that Mike painfully kind of, uh, I, th I think in his most complimentary tones he could muster, uh, 
of what we had to go through, it's a, it's a very arduous process. And when you're using your own resources, to, trying to do this properly, uh, it's a very, very challenging thing to do. Those piers, for the most part, were built in 1912. Uh, when we started the project, based on some work that Oracle had done when they took a look at it before abandoning their project, uh, it was estimated about $60 million of infrastructure costs would be incurred in bringing those piers back to life. Uh, we were putting something really heavy on it, so our costs, as the more we studied it, really had gotten to the point where we were somewhere north of $160 million just to refurbish uh, uh, the pier infrastructure itself. Um, and I, you know, our only kind of, we do have some sadness in leaving this site because I do really believe what, what with BCDC we had developed uh, could have been a uh, absolutely spectacular asset for the entire Bay Area. Uh, but we had to deal with the reality of how certain it was we could actually get that accomplished. Uh, we had put together our political team to go to the ballot in November uh, to ask the citizens of San Francisco uh, if this is a project they thought was uh, to their liking. Uh, really, had we gone forward with that, all that would have allowed us to do uh, was to spend $4 million to live to fight another day and go through the exact same process we were going through. Um, you know, I, 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 was, I am very complimentary of Larry and his staff at BCDC because I do think they helped us get to a much better place with the project. You know, unfortunately, I will say, I don't think all his commissioners were, were motivated the same way. I mean, I have had, you know, one of his commissioners actually come back to me saying, you know, I, I oppose your product, but uh, project, but of course I had to because I'm elected in the East Bay. But boy, if you guys ever decide to do something at Howard Terminal, let me carry, you know, let me carry your water for you there. That would be great. Well, just, it would have been the same project. I'm not quite sure why it would have been different. So, you know, there was a lot of politics involved, not all of it policy. It was policy at the BCDC uh, staff level. It wasn't always policy uh, at the commissioner level. Um, so we had an opportunity to find a place um, that provided us a lot more certainty and really uh, take us out of the regulatory path that we had to go through if we were going to eventually be successful. So we got some certainty. There were some trade-offs. Uh, we didn't really think it was possible to find a place that would be more expensive than Pierce 3032, but we have accomplished that, okay? That was, that was not a goal because as, uh, as benevolent uh, a guy as Mark Benioff is, he's also a really good businessman, okay? So uh, we certainly paid market rate uh, for some very, very expensive land. Uh, but it is land, and that's, of course, what's different about this. And it is private property, and it does sit within uh, an area that already has a master plan that this project does fit into. Uh, and it actually does some good things for the waterfront. It triggers the construction of a new five-acre park, the straightening of Terry Francois Boulevard, the construction of a new five-acre park uh, that will be between uh, the bay uh, and where uh, our brand new Warriors home will be. So uh, we're thrilled. Uh, the process was difficult. Uh, we really do appreciate the good work that the people who cared about this project gave us. We wish it was easier to get more people on the same agenda, and it would have been nice not to spend the $20 million to get where we are today. But uh, uh, we're thrilled. Uh, we think we're going to have a great place for everybody in the Bay Area to enjoy the Warriors for decades to come. And uh, we learned a lot. So with that, I'll say thank you. And we do have a great new coach, by the way. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rick. Uh, time to delve into questions. Okay, I have a couple, and while the blue cards slowly make their way up here, uh, we'll start with uh, one specific and then a couple general. Um, I want to acknowledge that we last night, Eric Young from the San Francisco Business Times, who's here with us today, broke a story about a new initiative that's going to go on the ballot in November in San Francisco, which is going to be a development-specific initiative uh, advocated by Forest City to uh, increase the height limit that's permitted on the waterfront. And that's partly in response to an initiative that's going on the June ballot in San Francisco to put, require that any height limits be put before the local voters. So I guess this question is very specifically for our, our friend from the State Lands Commission. Um, are either of those legal? Are, are we now letting the, are we letting the state, are, are we now gonna let local government or local voters set height limits on the waterfront? 
Hi, that's an excellent question. Um, we have um, we have actually uh, written a letter in response to the first proposition that was proposed, Proposition B, I believe, in San Francisco, um, identifying um, the legal concerns with um, the uh, the city's waterfront and the future of that waterfront being delegated to the local citizenry um, for th th for them to decide how it's it's developed when there was a very express legislative uh, trust grant to the city of San Francisco to the port commission to make those decisions as a fiduciary of a state uh, of the state on behalf of the state. Um, just for context, um, we were involved um, in a similar uh, local initiative involving the Port of San Diego and, um, and an attempt to uh, redevelop, um, displace an active maritime marine terminal, the 10th Avenue Marine Terminal in San Diego, um, and replace it with a mixed use development. Um, and the, the um, proponents were using a local initiative to achieve that. Um, our commission um, actually retained the attorney general's office, um, challenged, um, uh, conducted a pre-election challenge in that local initiative. The initiative ended up not passing, so we didn't have to take it further than that. But we have significant um, legal concerns with local initiatives that seek to um, surpass um, the delegation by the legislature to the local jurisdictions to make these decisions on behalf of the entire state. Thank you. And uh, oh, wow, now we have two microphones, so we can keep that one up there. Um, okay, this question is for, for everybody on the panel. A lot of us talked about, a lot of you talked about significant investment that's required in the waterfront, whether we're talking about infrastructure. And in the past, we've been lucky to have Prop 1B and people champion that, and we've had, you know, in the recent case of some Chinese investment coming in. Where do you all see the investment coming from in the future? I mean, just from the maritime perspective, you know, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We are all in a position where the market has to pay for itself. There's, there's no free lunch on the waterfront. Um, and if you would look at the erstwhile ports of Oakland and Los Angeles and Long Beach, there is no provision for taxpayer money to go into the maintenance or the construction or the operation of a seaport. Um, they are all proprietary agencies, and they need to sink or swim on their own. And um, so just in terms of maintaining the infrastructure we already have and doing development, it's, it's critical that when we do have opportunities like Prop 1B, um, that we jump on top of them because we do not have a regular revenue stream to build infrastructure um, and certainly not to operate our facilities. Um, and so we need to maintain competitiveness to make ourselves attractive to those people who would make the direct investments. And in um, our case, it's directly through leaseholders um, and the folks who are going to be making sure that we're facilitating cargo. So there, there's no way on the maritime side to grow infrastructure without growing trade. Anybody else? Well, don't quote me, but I'm happy to pay for it. Um, <laughs> And what I, I guess what I mean by that is private development is happy to partner uh, with public agencies um, in the form of rent payments, uh, in, in, in the form of, um, you know, uh, as we did with the port, uh, a cash transaction for land, and in the form of uh, infrastructure support, much like suburban development. Uh, if developers are building in, you know, uh, Livermore, they typically have to uh, extend some of the, again, that boring infrastructure stuff that everyone needs, water, sewer, power, et cetera. And I can't speak to maritime terminals, but I can speak to the stuff that serves them, and I can th uh, speak to the th things that uh, uh, support um, uh, waterfront development in general, past uh, and, and future. Uh, there's also financing mechanisms, uh, uh, finance districts that can be formed, such that new development can be held accountable to pay for some of this stuff. But uh, we're talking billions of dollars, and uh, you're not going to get that by turning your back on the development. So uh, on development, you have to embrace uh, uh, multifaceted development in order to help pay for some of this stuff. And again, also to pay for climate change adaptation, which is going to be huge. The only thing, only thing that I would add, Isaac, is I think it's, uh, it's definitely through public-private partnership, and it depends on the use. So, for example, when I talked about the Oakland Army Base and the, the working waterfront, we drew on a combination of federal, state, and local uh, dollars to pay for some of the infrastructure there. 
Uh, so I think that's part of it. I think the other part that uh, that Mike mentioned is, you know, the, the private interest on the part of the development side, but also, and Mike hinted at this as well, uh, Mellow Roof's financing for infrastructure and maintenance really will rely on uh, end-user contributions to uh, helping that stuff go as well. Maybe, Fred, you can keep the mic. Um, one of the hot topics that we didn't really touch on but is, you know, is a big topic in local government and foundation is resiliency. Uh, talk about resiliency and waterfront development, um, and, and is there a connection? Yeah, um, and again, Mike uh, mentioned this as well. I mean, it, there's a certain amount of this that has to do uh, with responding to climate change and, and sea level rise, and uh, obviously when folks talk about resiliency, that's one uh, component uh, of it and being able to make sure that uh, whatever we're doing on the waterfront has the ability to be uh, adaptive and responsive to uh, not only things that we uh, predict will happen on the waterfront, but things that we uh, may not have the ability to predict uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, natural disaster and that kind of stuff. So I think it's actually a, a really important part of the, the planning that needs to be done. Anyone else? Jennifer? No? Okay, this is a question from the audience. This is, well, it's more of a statement, but we'll, we'll try to turn it into a question here. Too much attention has been given to repurposing, repositioning our waterfronts for housing, recreational, and open space. Little attention has been paid to revitalizing these old industrial areas with emerging new industries for the 21st century, such as clean tech, advanced manufacturing, shipping, trade, logistics, biotech, etc. Is this true or not, and where are there examples or not? Um, I'll start. I think it's partially true. Uh, I think there are examples of uh, um, waterfront development uh, projects that have been responsive to those things. I think a good example, particularly if you talk about uh, biotech, is uh, Mission Bay in San Francisco. And uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, Rick talked about the uh, part of it that was, uh, you know, formerly owned by uh, Salesforce, but a huge part of Mission Bay's planning and development revolved around uh, biotech. Um, also, you know, I didn't mention this, but the a lot of the planning that we're doing around uh, the Coliseum City uh, concept, again, uh, uh, part of it focuses in on the, the sports complex, but a, a large part of that is also about trying to figure out if there is a, uh, a way for us to connect with the emerging clean tech, biotech, uh, uh, science and technology uh, trends that are out there as well. So I think, uh, I think it's a fair criticism, but I also think you can find examples of, of folks trying to be responsive to that. Just, uh, I, I guess another take on that is that um, we've got two different dynamics um, going on in, in our industry, which both facilitate that um, problem, but also foster an opportunity. Uh, we don't have near dock facilities like we used to in terms of warehousing, uh, distribution centers, transloading facilities. And uh, you, you'll notice that you don't have the same type of investment in that in the Bay Area, certainly in Southern California, where it's most pronounced, most of that development is happening in the Inland Empire. It doesn't happen close in because of pressures on that property in terms of cost um, and uh, issues with neighbors, things like that, because they are industrial. Um, and the pressure that we feel is, are you losing your industrial feel in your property? Of course, the opportunity there is to maintain the industrial base um, because what we like to see is the maintenance of an industrial buffer around our, our, um, our facilities, and the opportunity is there to do reinvestment, um, an industrial base that does create a separation between the maritime industry and our operations, which are heavy industry, and uh, the encroachment from potentially uh, conflicting land uses like housing. So I think we'd like to see that, that opportunity grow as well. Um, cities don't need to give up their industrial base in order to, to have a prosperous waterfront. And both a uh, light industry or biotech can certainly fit in with the existing heavy industry that's there. But you can't expect that warehousing or other things that are very sensitive to high prices in terms of land costs that are, are going to come back into the, uh, the mix. It's just not going to happen. Maybe on that note, uh, this question says, given pressures to convert industrial waterfronts to non-industrial uses, would you support industrial land banks or other mechanisms to strengthen the maritime industrial sector? Can you say that again? I, I guess it's you know, the, the concept of reconciling or maybe setting aside lands that, are, that we're going to say these are going to be industrial lands versus these ones are ones we're going to target for housing and other developments. I mean, does it make sense to try and 
you know, segment out more clearly. I mean, Mike, you touched on zoning and the fact that there's so many different agencies. Maybe are, are, are there strategies that we're, we've not explored? Um, I think when I was talking earlier, I mean, I, I, first of all, I, 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 I think there's been a number of waterfront developments. Again, looking at Oakland Global and, and uh, uh, the kind of working waterfront that that's creating and Mission Bay, uh, even Jack London Square has Sungevity and, and other clean tech um, and, and solar type companies. So I don't agree with the notion that everything's going to housing, for instance, or recreation. There's, there's a, I think, a big balanced approach that's been happening around the Bay. Um, that being said, I don't think just setting aside la land works. Uh, in San Francisco, large portions of the um, waterfront were set aside in industrial protection zones and uh, they employed more Rottweilers than they did people. Um, it just it didn't work. Uh, there was still speculative, speculative value uh, as a premium placed on the land. It didn't change the overall um, cost of doing business, whether it's wage or, or other type of uh, uh, pressures that are not felt in the Inland Empire or uh, big distribution centers in the, in the Central Valley. So from a real estate and operations standpoint, it still is not viable to do large scale uh, warehousing and, and manufacturing. Now there's lots of niche manufacturing uh, that is coming and there's some talk about onshoring. And so, but, but we have lots of uh, land around the Bay Area for that that's still readily available. So uh, I, I don't think, I don't agree with the notion that it's all disappearing. Um, and uh, I also don't agree with the notion that um, giant areas should be set aside because basically the market is uh, reacting and it's not, or not reacting, it hasn't done much uh, even for the set-aside lands. I would just add that one thing I didn't mention uh, in terms of some of the stuff that's happening in Oakland is uh, we actually engaged in multiple years of uh, planning for what's called the estuary plan, uh, which is kind of in central East Oakland. And uh, as a part of that planning process, there was a, a raging debate around this issue of uh, setting aside for industrial space versus uh, uh, residential. And, uh, the conclusion that was drawn there through that planning process was that we actually did need to uh, preserve the industrial space. And so that plan actually focuses in on that. So what about a uh, fast track policy for public use development of industrial or abandoned uh, waterfront properties? You know, legislative fast track EIR process, et cetera. Is this something that uh, we'd propose and is, is feasible? Fast track waterfront development. Oxymoron, you know, of the, <laughs> oxymoron of the day. Um, you know, one of the things that I was uh, thinking about in, in prepping for this is kind of what some of the lessons have been uh, in, uh, around waterfront development. And from my perspective, actually working on both sides of the bay, uh, and I kind of highlighted three things. Uh, bring your money, bring your body armor, and your sleeping bag. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, don't, I, don't see a, uh, I don't see a fast track uh, uh, approach. Okay, um, with that, let's, let's add, Mike, uh, jobs at the port have increased, uh, says here, longshore payroll, while TEUs are going down. What will it take to grow? Is it about death of channels, cost of labor, uh, birthing, regulations? Why is Oakland one of the few ports decreasing? Um, yes. Uh, we, I think we have a, a uh, th there's a, there's one thing that needs to be said is we're doing a better job at keeping our cargo than LA and Long Beach in Oakland. So don't <laughs> don't get too upset about the charts up there. We're still better than, you know, the, the big uh, second town to the south. But San Pedro Bay is also setting itself up in ways that we can't to take that next round of cargo growth. Um, and it's essentially through automation. Um, they are setting themselves up to become that much more efficient and to reduce overall costs, and they can also move more boxes per container. So as we move to larger ships, and we're discharging more cargo um, at a port, we also move it faster and cheaper through an automated system. Um, and the way that the economics of our business is working is those investment numbers we're talking about. So in Long Beach, there's a new terminal that's going in. They're going to require $3 billion of investment just in that terminal. To make that work, you're going to move more cargo just through that one terminal than the Port of Oakland does in a year. Um, and that creates a lot of gravity. It creates a lot of sucking sounds um, across our industry. 
um, where that's the place where you slot your next cargo, uh, 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 your next cargo container. And so I think the opportunity for us is to maximize on the place where we've maintained market share um, and to really focus on, you heard from the Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Ross, this morning, focus on what maintains uh, competitiveness in the Bay Area, and that's exports. And LA and Long Beach can't compete with us on the export side. If our export side is growing and it's maintaining uh, the place it does in our routing, uh, which means that ships still need the call here and they can't ignore Oakland, then you have the opportunity to maintain some import presence too because you're going to be coming to this port no matter what. Um, but that just means that on the, on the natural, you're going to be talking about cost. What's the, what's the offload cost in LA and Long Beach versus Oakland and what kind of service are you providing for your customer? Um, and so th there isn't a, a quick answer, um, and we do have a lot of challenges ahead for the Port of Oakland, but there's an asset there that a lot of other ports don't have when they compete with LA and Long Beach, and that's our export cargo. This is perhaps a related question that will also you know, migrate down to uh, Fred and Mike. How can we reconcile rail with waterfront development in Oakland? Are there any plans to improve access for both maritime and non-maritime development um, as it relates to rail, both passenger and freight? That, that's a tough question, um, and it, it's a tough question because um, it really depends on what you're talking about. As we were a little bit earlier, um, there is some uh, waterfront development, particularly when I talked about the working waterfront, that actually relies on uh, rail uh, in order to be effective, and uh, some of that rail uh, investment has to do with uh, kind of making sure that there's the ability from uh, just an efficiency point of view to move cargo directly to rail so that it can be moved throughout the region. Uh, but there's also a, a component of it to make sure that, that those working waterfront activities have access to um, intermodal means of transportation in order to move things around. And so uh, one aspect of it is uh, I think the, the need to invest in rail, uh, build on it, and enhance it. Uh, I think in other cases, and I think this is uh, uh, the, I think a good example of this would be Howard Terminal. There is a need to figure out how to um, literally bridge the rail uh, in order to, to increase access uh, to the waterfront. And so it, it, it's a very, the, the relationship between waterfront development and, and rail is very nuanced depending on what you're really trying to achieve. Actually, since um, you brought... Just one more thing to add, and this kind of gets to the other uh, question that you asked that I tongue-in-cheek response to uh, around fast tracking is that whatever it is, and, and rail fits into this, to the extent that really thoughtful community planning can precede specific project proposals, uh, I think that uh, it doesn't guarantee success, but significantly increases the likelihood uh, that you're going to be successful in terms of trying to really do waterfront development activities. Well, and since you brought it up, and actually I guess it relates to both the fast track element and the Howard Terminal element, question for uh, Jennifer. Will the State Lands Commission need to approve the change of land use at Howard Terminal? What will the process be for such approval? Um, if, if that um, proposal can move forward, um, it, I suspect um, it would be very similar to the Warriors' efforts at Pier 3032. Um, again, um, the Howard Terminal and, and much of the Port of Oakland um, is part of the uh, legislative grant to the City of Oakland. That grant basically transfers the daily control and management um, to the Port of Oakland. Um, the State Lands Commission doesn't typically get involved in the day-to-day -day activities. It doesn't approve projects by the Port of Oakland. Um, so so uh, there, there is obviously um, some significant trust consistency issues with the Howard Terminal, um, especially related um, to its, um, its not too distant um, maritime use um, aspect of it. Uh, so um, we will be likely engaging with the Port of Oakland as our grantee, with the project proponents um, as, this, as the proposal moves forward. Um, but uh, the State Lands Commission does not have a specific uh, approval authority over the change in use at the Howard Terminal. Thank you. Um, okay, question down for, for Rick, um, and I think this is an important one because while we're talking about waterfront development, the reality is that 
the whole bay is waterfront to some extent. We're just talking about the regulatory constraints. So do you have any plans to connect your development to the waterfront? Thank you for asking that, Larry. Same question you asked me before. Uh, we very much would like to. Uh, we're three weeks into this right now. So uh, again, what happens is, those of you who know Terry Francois Boulevard, it hugs the, uh, the bay right now. Uh, when this development uh, is, is ready to go, uh, Terry Francois gets straightened and creates this wonderful new uh, waterfront park, uh, five acre park, that will be what will be between the bay and uh, blocks 29 to 32. By the way, the, the irony, do you ever think it, in my lifetime I could figure out the irony that we're, we really are going to 30, 32 because those are the blocks we're building on, it just doesn't happen to be piers, okay? <laughs> How could you make that up? But uh, actually, the early design plans for the arena do place the arena on the far uh, eastern edge of that 12-acre uh, site, uh, which means that right outside our front doors will be that five-acre park. So I think it's incumbent upon us uh, to work with those in Mission Bay who are designing that park to make sure that there's, there's a uh, real continuity in, in, on both sides of the streets to, to maximize the, you know, the, the enjoyable factors that can, can really come from having a park there. Great. Now, we've talked about on the financing side, the public-private partnerships, the uh, you know, investment from overseas, investment from waterfront users, and what's, what it's going to take to drive that investment. In Los Angeles, for one of their, their science research center called Alta C, which is on their old historic pier, a massive foundation grant came in from the Annenberg Foundation that really helped, uh, you know, catalyze that project. I'm curious, I know this is, you know, not to put you on the spot, Fred, but as you transition to your new role, do you see any foundations, um, including the San Francisco Foundation, <laughs> potentially having a role in uh, funding amazing projects on the waterfront? <laughs> um, wow. I wasn't expecting that one, Isaac. Um, just a couple of thoughts on that. Um, one is, I think that uh, obviously it depends on the foundation. There are, there are a lot of foundations that are moving towards uh, kind of mission-related investments and program-related investments and figuring out ways to mobilize not only their grant-making uh, activities, but mobilize their corpus towards achieving uh, social impact. And I think that that's uh, something that uh, uh, is worth looking at. Um, I think that what's more likely, uh, what you're more likely to see from uh, kind of progressive foundations like the San Francisco Foundation and others that are here in the Bay Area is a strong interest in figuring out how, whether it's waterfront development or other development that's going on, how to kind of capture uh, some of the, the, the benefits uh, of those developments for folks who have sometimes uh, lived through years of disinvestment and neglect and really trying to find the intersection between investment and growth uh, and employment and contracting opportunities for kind of the adjacent communities, which in, in often cases are uh, low-income communities and communities of color. Thank you. And, and certainly one of the projects that's, that's been doing a bit of that is the Oakland Global Project. And this is a very specific question. We'll see if you, you even can answer it or have the information. Oakland Global's bulk terminal plans. What products shipped? Who was involved? Compatibility with Oakland's current container-focused operations. The, the bulk terminal, like wh wh what's, what, what products are we looking at? Um, who's involved? Or is, it, is it, where is it at? It's a rather detailed question about the bulk terminal component of the Oakland Global Project. Yeah, um, so th the way that that uh, project is working, we're, we're doing that partnership, uh, pr project in partnership with uh, uh, Prologis, which is uh, uh, an internationally known and publicly traded uh, trade and logistics uh, uh, company. And, um, CCIG, which is a, uh, a local uh, development uh, firm. And it's actually CCIG, uh, that part of the partnership, uh, that is our partner on the, uh, the bulk terminal. Uh, and uh, there are really kind of multiple aspects to it, but the two that I think are really worth uh, mentioning here is that they're our partner both in the kind of uh, vertical development and infrastructure development and creating the terminal, uh, but also our partner uh, in terms of kind of running the, the, the rail operation uh, out there that it is uh, going to be necessary to unlock some of the value there. Um, you know, we are still in the, uh, the throes of uh, 
uh, talking about and, and figuring out what the specific commodities are going to be. Um, but uh, we know that uh, uh, some of that will probably focus in on iron ore. Uh, and uh, we're also looking at uh, uh, opportunities for grain. And on the, the relationship to the container shipping, obviously it's complementary. Um, we, we don't have a uh, problem with not enough container capacity at the Port of Oakland. If anything, we have too much um, because we aren't competing at the level we expect to. So uh, Oakland is the only major seaport in California, which is 99% container driven. Um, diversifying the port's cargo flow is actually going to be, we think, a positive thing. Okay, maybe final question, just kind of, you can, uh, any of you can take this. Um, while it's hard to develop on the waterfront, and probably even harder to expand and create new waterfront, there's been a lot of talk about creating pseudo waterfront, which is floating waterfront and projects in the bay. Any thoughts on that and any other closing thoughts as we wrap up? Okay, well, there you go. That was a, <laughs> that was a winning question right there. <laughs> Um, all right, well, in that case, uh, we will go ahead and wrap up. Thanks, thanks to our panelists. Thanks to all of you for taking the time and asking some great questions. Time for some lunch.